construct 25 different uh, uh, triangles. And you put them this way and that way, it never works. Then you turn to page 20, at the bottom there is the solution, which tells you make one match stand up, and all of a sudden, instead of having a 2D, two-dimension solution, you have a three-dimension solution, huh, and it works because that, like this and like this and like that, you know these riddles, it works. So let's take this stand-up match, or third-dimension uh, formula, into politics. The two-state solution is a flat 1D, one-dimension, maximum two-dimension solution. Will never work because of whatever history we're having. How about a 3D solution? The ground floor is constitutional, as I said, every individual has the right to have the same rights. The mezzanine floor is the very political and for some very national one. I'm a post-nationalist. I, I, I do not belong, as Hannah Arendt said at the time, I am not married to any ethnical collective. I'm committed to ideas and values only. But most of the people in our region, both of our community, are very national in their tribal approach. Why? Because. So the mezzanine floor will be the state of Israel which, in which most of the issues of the Jewish collective will be resolved and the state of Palestine in which most of the issues of the Palestinian collective will be solved. And then comes the third floor. This is the confederation between the two. Because if we are living next door to each other, it is impossible that he take a leak at the top of the hill and I drink pee pee by the bottom of it. Whether he lives in Nablus and I live in Atania, or I live in Beit El and he lives wherever it is. Environment stands no borders. So we need some coordination about the environmental infrastructure. Then it goes to other places. It's impossible that we live next door to each other. And for him, a certain action is atrocity. And for me, it's the ulterior patriotic expression. We have to level the constitutional conceptual value system of the two of the two of the two entity of the two entities. And therefore it will not be a two states division the land and, and walk away as if we do not exist. It will be a very augmented situation in which you have a ground floor of constitutional values mezzanine floor of political solution and confederation roofing, which is the coordination of the whole thing. If you tell me, Avraham, it's, it's impossible, it will never work. Did you ever in your best dreams could have thought hundred and some years ago that the neo Habsburg, Habsburgian uh, 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 Caesar our Kaiser Angela Merkel will be well supported by the post-Napoleonic uh, 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 um, France of Hollande? <laughs> Could never in your lifetime. And that's the axis of current Europe. And much more blood in many more years was shedded in Europe than between us on religious and ideological and ethnical and political and economic and religious and bullshit reasons. <laughs> Mainly the last one. <laughs> and it's that, this is only between France and Germany. What about both of them in England? Netherlands and Spain? Huh? Gewalt? Italy and Austria? And I can go on and on and on and on and what do you see today at the, Europe, at the Central European side, with all the challenges it, it is facing nowadays, it has exactly this three flaws formula. With another twist to the story, contemporary Central European Europe developed a fantastic concept which says, unlike United States of America, which is a federation which eradicates all the previous identity of its citizens, the United States of Europe sanctifies the various other differences of each other, yet 
you do not have to be militaristic and national chauvinist in order to express your particular patriotism. That's a new evolution in, 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 in human political thinking. And I believe it is possible between us. Not all of us immediately, not day one, but the process can go there. So this is a missing link in the political formula. Something about the political generators, I take it that Seri can copy paste it into his reality, but I will describe mine. I was born into Israeli political life. I mean, really, from womb, I'm part of this because of my family and because of this and that. Up until 20, 25 years ago, in Israel, there were three generators which generated, poli generated political content. It was the parties themselves, within the party, between the parties, the rivalry, the disagreement, the dialectic political processes. Then on top of it, you had the media, which accompanied and reflected and enriched every ideological nuance of the political arena. And then on top of it, you had the academia that came in and out, out and in, and enriched and actually fertilized the political system and the dialogical thinking. In the last 20 to 25 years, the political system is dead. Not even one new idea was introduced into the Israeli political equation since Oslo. And even Oslo was not totally new. Rabin's assassination was the last political idea in the Israeli political equations. The media is a well, is a dry well. Less and less, uh, less and less media, less and less newspaper, less and less free thinking, less, less and less uh, 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 pure journalism and opinion op-ed pages. And the academia locked the gates of the ivory tower, took off and is on its way to Marsh. And in Israel of the last political generation, there is not even one generator of new concepts and new idea. And when you tell me I'm still active in politics, I'm not active in politics. I'm active in this desert which is called political writing. I write and write and write and nobody reads. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> life I have. <laughs> But, but at least sometimes you meet with people and you also talk, which is not, which is Listen, not exactly I, I active was, politics. I was the Speaker of the House. I'm a professional bullshitter, <laughs> okay? I have, one st I have one question left for tonight and that I want to give to both of you, and that is maybe a very banal question, but it's what comes next. What comes first? I mean, the the prophets of the parallel state solution, or whatever they don't name it, solution. Um, they also dream of a kind of federation of uh, citizenship on the basis of two states that don't have a defined territorial partition on that territory between the Jordan and the sea. Um, but still two states with two passports, two flags, two national anthems, two uh, system sets of things being proud of, but more. Two legal systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so it's some kind, of, some kind of a hybrid between a federation like the EU that still combines different nation states, but still, at least in most part of the EU, allows free movement and even free choice of settle, settlement and, and, and work, and a concept that is uh, something even more close to a federal state like Austria or Switzerland or Germany, um, where some parts of this is, is really already reunite, reunited or reunited. But when I listen to both of you, I mean, saying basically that the foundation, the foundation of everything is that everybody between the Jordan and the sea has to have the, the right for the same rights. So the basic is, 
in a way one constitutional, one constitution. Uh, but still the question remains, today we have one state, but we have no constitution and we, know, we have no federation and we have no equal rights. What will come first? The two states and then the federation or first the constitution and then the federation and then to whatever kind of entities that you might call Canton, that would be the name of our Swiss neighbors, or state, as it is in Austria, or Länder, if it is, if you say German name, in Germany. But well, what will come first? Do you have any idea? Because that is, a, in, a, in in a way, the basic choice that we have to do. Are we still fighting for two states, and then we ask for the other things, or are we asking for the other things first? I'll go first and then Sarah will sum up, okay? Is that okay? Yeah, uh, you will sum up. First and you will sum up, so you'll be the last one. You want, okay? me, you want me to sum up what you said? Yes, <laughs> and what you said. Uh, if you will sum up what I say, so maybe I will understand what I told them. Um, <laughs> I want to repeat an anecdote I think I, say, I told some of you here between these, two wall, between these walls. Here are the two Jewish gentlemen walking toward the, towards each other in the streets of Tel Aviv. And one is holding two gigantic watermelons under his armpits, and the other one is asking him, excuse me, do you know where is Bialik Street? So he said, will you hold the watermelons for a second? So he takes the watermelon and says, I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. Will you hold the watermelon for a second, Hanno? I mean, I don't know what comes first. <laughs> but I can tell you the following things. Um, I see already the cracks, which Seri indicated in a very subtle way of the different political discourse. It is not the discourse of I'm deprived, I'm desperate, I'm unprivileged. This is the discourse of rights. Israel, you are the only democracy in the Middle East. This is what you say, or at least you are the only half democracy in the Middle East. Democracies are about rights. What about my right to vote? What about my right for equality? Where do I do it? Ramallah, Tel Aviv, just tell me. And this argument is gonna bite Israel at its backside more and more. The more it will argue it is a democracy, the more it develops the Palestinian discourse of rights. And I see the cracks already. Going to the UN is part of it, and going to the Hague is part of it. It's legitimate national, diplomatic, and sometimes individual civil non-violent disobedience. This is something Israel has no answer for. We have an answer for violence. We understand the language. It will never deter us. We have no clue what to do with civil disobedience, which is based on the discourse of rights. The mechanism, the two mechanisms that will open it up one is conceptual, that we indicated parts of it, and one is mechanical. The conceptual is the Israelis should stop think in terms of partition and begin to think in terms of shared space and shared privileges, whatever shared is. Not necessarily 50-50, maybe you would take this part and I'll take this part. You take housing and I take infrastructure. I take power, you take police. You take justice, I take religion, whatever it is. It's not necessarily 50-50 in each office. But stop thinking in terms of partition because the Zionist movement since day one had the concept of us and not them. We are here and you are there and it didn't work. This is what brought us up until here and you cannot go out of the problem with the same ingredients that actually constructed the problem. So not only conceptual alternative to a petition, I know how the mechanism will work. I don't know exactly how, but I know the direction. Israel reacts fantastically beautifully, honestly, very good to traumas. 73 was the most traumatic conflict we had ever since, which led four and a half, three and a half years later to the visit of Sadat and to the establishment of the peace with Egypt. The first Gulf War 
led to the Madrid conference and to whatever consequences came out of it. The first intifada led to Oslo. So if, and there will be a trauma out there. I mean, it boils, it's in the cooking, it's in the kitchen. I don't know what will be the nature of it. I don't know what will be the size of it. Will it be external or internal? Will it be both? Will it be international pressure? Will it be something to do with the Temple Mount? Will it be something symbolic? Will it be something political? I don't know. Who could have predicted the Twin Towers or Paris the other day? But once a trauma like this will happen, not necessarily in size and in victims, but in quality, if people like us with the kind of thoughts that we introduce here today, and each and every one of us separately develop in his, uh, in his own uh, constituency, if we will be ready with enough conceptual containers, we will be able to contain the trauma and to offer an alternative. And I think that's the task, to develop the alternatives for the day after the trauma rather than adopt despair and say there will be trauma and then we should be eradicated and then whatever it is. This is a destructive, from my point of view, a destructive, not constructive approach to public responsibility.